This week on Quality Digest Live, we talked to Mike Richman <laughs> about quality <laughs> in government. Imagine I that. <laughs> Imagine that. I don't know. <laughs> Is that an oxymoron? Well, I don't know. Join us in a minute and we'll find out. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest, and sitting right next to me here is my old co-host, Mike Richmond. Uh, right, Mike. Hey, man, hey, who has uh, <laughs> gone over to the, uh, the, the dark side. The dark side. <laughs> the darker side. <laughs> Some people think media is the dark side, but... No. <laughs> no, no, media no. is really the light side, Derek, let me tell trust, you. Trust me, trust, trust me. me on this one, yeah. uh, and what we're referring to, obviously, is that you're Politics. kind of working somewhat in the po political realm. I now. am, yeah. I am, yes. I've been talking to a lot of people. Um, I don't know how many folks know this. I actually slipped once or twice on this show where I said, welcome <laughs> to NorCal News Now. Um, I, I've been doing a show called NorCal News Now for, uh, for a couple of years. Uh, believe it or not, when Trump became elected, became pr elected as right, president, right. we started this show, um, and uh, that show, and uh, I learned a lot from that, I met a lot of people, and from that evolved kind of my uh, desire to get into politics and work with, but with politicians of all things, um, and you know, kind of try to be a little bit of the, um, of the answer maybe to some of the issues that we're having in politics today. Okay. Well, the reason I wanted you to come uh, onto the show, besides just saying hi again and, and so forth, is uh, to discuss something, as you've mm -hmm. mentioned, that we've talked about several times, is kind of quality in government. I, I guess maybe rather than government, maybe I should say uh, uh, quality in, in lawmaking or quality in, in politics, because I don't want to denigrate the, uh, the hundreds of thousands of government workers who really, like workers in any industry, try their best every single day to deliver good service and, and good products uh, uh, from the government to uh, the people that they, that they serve. But they work within a system that is sometimes, um, uh, I don't know, I guess you could say could use a healthy shot of quality. I <laughs> yes, mean, would, right. wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? I would agree. Okay. Would agree. So, as someone who has been reporting on uh, quality for uh, quite a while and, uh, and also a political junkie, do you think well, let me, let me back this up a little bit. <clears throat> One thing that, that anybody who works in quality knows is everything's based on data. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to uh, uh, work on a, uh, solving a problem or a process, uh, the first thing you do within the quality realm is, is you collect data and you analyze the data. And then sometimes you analyze the analysis. And sometimes people disagree with the way the data was connected, the analysis was done, and that's fine. And we have discussions about the data. And it always comes back down to the data so that decisions are based on data. Mm -hmm. So within lawmaking in the political realm. Do you see that lawmakers are actually interested in dealing with data? Well, Re I mean, real data. <laughs> well, the surprising answer, I think, is yes, that they are. But the, the problem is, and what you have to understand is, politics is, is well, I was going to say it's unlike anything else, but it is similar in a certain sense to business because some of it is show business and some of it is actually work. I mean, you have to get elected. If you're a congressperson, if you're a representative in the U.S. House of Representatives, you need to run every two years. If you're a senator, you need to run every six years. If you're a president, you need to run every four years. So there's that show business part of it. And in that part of it, when you're actually, actually an elected official, data facts are malleable. They need to be malleable because you need to go out to your constituency and although we always say, well, as constituents, we want the facts. We want to know what's really going on. We don't. I mean, really, the partisanship really pulls that to the side a little bit more. People want to hear what they want to hear. And to get elected, those representatives need to do that. Now, the way that's similar to business is that CEOs kind of do the same thing when they do their conference calls with investors and, sure. and, and financial groups where they kind of do the dog and pony show. It's very similar in that way. But underneath that, when you take the hood up and you look at it underneath it, yeah, facts really do matter because the people, as you mentioned, the workers, the staff people, the people that are actually making policy, and the people that make policy really aren't the elected representatives. They're often the staff members, they're often people on panels, they're often experts that are brought in. 
those are the people that make policy. Yeah, those people have to deal with facts. And they have to really know what the truth of the matter is and work accordingly to make policy that can be, uh, that can be acceptable by the majority of the people. Policy at what level, I guess, mm -hmm. then, I would say, is because laws, you know, obviously on the federal level, right. uh, well, on the state level, too, they, they pass through a legislative community, right? Mm -hmm. So in the, on the federal level, you've got to go through Congress, right? Who can choose whether or not they are going to accept facts from their staff people mm -hmm. or, you know, data that's collected by the hundreds of agencies that are in the United States whose sole job is to collect and analyze right. data. And doesn't it seem that... Uh, lawmakers kind of pick and choose which facts they want to use in order to make policy. Absolutely. Again, that's, that's, that's the part of it that involves going out to the constituency and getting reelected. You know, you need to look at what you're being told and you say, well, let's not focus on that piece of this, this question. I mean, these are complex questions. I mean, none of these questions that get to the level of federal policy and even state policy, as you mentioned, are easy. They're not. If they were, they would have been solved decades ago. In many cases, um, uh, things like tax policy are complicated. You know, healthcare is very, very complicated. Immigration reform. Those are all really, really complicated things. So there's elements to all those things that a politician can pick and choose and can say, well, you know, this tax policy is really easy, but people can understand what marginal rates mean and how increasing a marginal rate, what that means. Now, now that's a big controversy. As people are, are the Democrats are really putting that out into the blogosphere where they're saying, well, we need to raise these marginal rates to 70, 80, 90 percent at the very top, which doesn't mean, of course, many people know this, some don't. That doesn't mean that you get taxed on all your income at that 80 or 90 percent right, right. rate. It means right. at, at a certain level you get taxed at that. You pay everybody, like everybody else up to that level. Um, but the, the point is that you, know, you look at that and you say, well, you know, we, we want to look at that particular piece of tax policy and explain that and make that our, our, our what we're going to run on going to make that the piece of policy that we're going to run. Now, tax policy is really complicated, it is complicated beyond right, right. that, but that yeah. one little piece of it can be explained to a vast majority of people. And if you're a progressive, if you're on the left, you look at that and you say, yeah, tax the rich, man. We need the money. Soak the rich. Well, it's more complicated than that. And that's going to be part of a package of tax policy if there's a different president in the White House who will sign off on a, on a more progressive tax policy. That'll be part of a huge package of tax policy reform that that may be one little piece of it. Even that will probably be negotiated as the bill goes through Congress and the Senate and then eventually gets the president's desk. Well, here, here I guess is, is, is where I'm coming from, is again, kind of alluding to what I said in, in, in the intro. On a quality level, on a you know, manufacturing or service, or on, on a business level, when we want to solve a problem, we collect all this data and that data is out there. It's, it's, we try to make it transparent, at least within the company, so that uh, you know, engineering may come and say, look, uh, we, we've collected all this data and we think you should do this. And the sales guys may look at that and go, well, you know, I'm not sure you're really looking at the right things because the feedback we're getting from our customers that is that we need this and it has to work this way. And I don't think you've really taken that into consideration the day you've collected it. And there's just all this back and forth, but the data is there. We know we have customer data, we have manufacturing data, we have, uh, you know, field reports and, and return data. We have all this data at our fingertips that we can look at and we can analyze and argue about. Mm -hmm. Does that work? And, and maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe you've already answered it, I haven't heard it. Does that really, does that model work when we're talking about we've got to make a decision on something in government? No, because the, the reason it's different is because within a business environment, sales is an ongoing process. And the, the sales numbers are vital to the success of the organization. And that's ongoing. And pe people vote with their dollars. Consumers vote with their dollars. They vote with their, their buying power. That's happening all the time. Whereas for an elected official, again, at the minimum, they're going out to the, the people every two years. So of course they care, yeah. they want to win that vote, they want their polling numbers to look good, but in a certain sense, there's not the same imperative that there is for a business to be on that data and, and know really the truth about what the feedback loops are and respond to those. It's much more imperative for a business to do that, I think, than for an elected official. Well, th then, then how do you, <clears throat> how do you, take these ideas that we know work within business, business. and ap 
apply them, or is it even possible to apply those to government and say, look, there's a better way for, for getting the outcomes that we want, for getting the outcomes that we, we know we should get. There's you, a better way to do this. How do you do, you do that in government? What does that mean? Define that first. What are the outcomes that we want? I mean, you're, you're dealing with, with a fractious... Right, right, uh, right. I, I mean, a, a fact, you're dealing with all these people in constituency, even a local constituency like here in Chico. I mean, you have a wide variety of people. So when you have a business where you have customers, in theory, they all want the same thing. They want your product or they don't. But in theory, there's a lot more homogeneity. Homogeneity? Uh, uh, hum <laughs> it's all the same. Yes, yeah, right. It's all the <laughs> same. All the, one of those big words. Hom homogeneous. <laughs> Homogeneous, yeah, yes, there there's much more of that. Um, in, in a, I think in a, in a in a sales environment with a, with a, with the customers that are looking to buy a product, in a in electorate, there's so many different varieties of opinion. So how do how do you make all those things harmonize? Well, that was my question. I was going to ha have really for you. Can. It, well, can you have a fact based discourse? Yes. To honestly approach. Okay. Policy. Yes. You, <laughs> okay. You, again, okay. You do. It's like it's going on on two levels. You okay. do. Yes. I think you very much do. Talking to the people that I know who are who are in office or have run for office and have been in other offices lower to federal level or state level, um, they will tell you that yes, the fact-based discourse is very strong when you're dealing with with the reality of an issue. But it's just not when you go out to the the voters. When you go out to the voters to ask for their vote, you can't. I mean. A guy like Al Gore was really wonky, right? Okay, right you remember right. Al Gore? Yeah. Al Gore was very wonky, and he really went out. He invented the internet. He invented the internet. <laughs> <laughs> he went out to the to his his constituency even before he ran for vice president and, and president. Uh, he went out to his constituency, and he was very clear about these are the issues, this is how we're going to deal with them, and it was very dry. Uh, some people loved it because they felt like they really got a real deep dive into it from a guy who really was very cognizant of what those issues were and and could kind of explain them, but most people were like, huh? Uh, yeah. You know, it's just like, I mean, it's too complex. You need to boil that down. Trump, I mean, I'm not a fan of our president, but Trump really is good at boiling down things into uh, an understandable bite-sized piece that his constituency can understand. And even people on the other side can understand. They may not like it, but they understand where, where he's going and what he's talking about. Okay, then with, with, all, with all that said yeah. then, as, as I mentioned earlier, we've got, oh gosh, we, we, we deal with NIST quite a bit. Sure. Um, but I mean, you look at any of the major agencies, whether it's uh, NIST or, or FDA or NOAA or um, uh, any of those large agencies, they all collect tons of data. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're collecting climate data. They're collecting, you know, clinical trial data. They're, they're you know, collecting census data. They're collecting all this data and they're doing all this crunching. You know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, all these, all this data that's out there and, you know, thousands of statisticians in the government that are crunching this data. Why? Yeah. I mean, if it's not used for policy, why the heck are we no, doing it? it is used for policy. <laughs> So what I'm saying is I'm, I'm trying, I, I, maybe I'm not stating right. In terms of policy, in terms of making policy, in terms of, of, of creating laws and guidelines that, that need to be followed, that is being done. What but, I'm saying is politicians, when they go out to ask for a vote, don't talk about that stuff. Well, no, but I'm not sure it's even being, I, I, I guess I'm not even sure it's really being used when it comes to uh, uh, lawmaking, and, and I, I guess I'll give one example, and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds okay. on this, but you look, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, what was it, the, uh, the national, uh, what, the, the climate report, mm -hmm. uh, the, the national climate report, or what that was, yep. that was called, and President Trump just immediately, oh, I don't believe all that. Yeah. And of course then, you know, the Republican Congress, oh, well, we don't believe all of that either. So, so, so there's the data. <laughs> I, I, but I don't know if he does believe it or not. I don't know if he personally believes it or not. Well, personally, right. But I, I mean, doesn't I mean, doesn't what he says then, and then, and then, you know, obviously, you know, the, the Republican side of the Congress has got to back the president. That only makes sense. Doesn't that then, here's this data, well, we're going to ignore it, and that's going to affect policy yeah, going does. forward, it right? Does. So does. that's what I'm saying is you've got this data, but it's like, eh, we don't like it right now, so we're just not going to yeah. we're not going to make any policies and, and, based on it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, from that perspective, you're right. I mean, in terms of in terms of you, you know, you do have to if you're running on something, you do have to support it with policy that aligns in some way with that with that that vote that you got. So you can't ignore it. What I'm saying is that I don't know internally in the councils of meeting rooms and, and staff rooms 
and the White House, wherever policy is made. I don't know that there's not a, a considered opinion given to that data. I think that data is heard. I think it's looked at. I think there's very smart people that are, that are in, in government. And I think they understand what that data means. They try to understand better how to manipulate it to a certain extent to make it fit into what they told the voters are going to do. Sometimes that's not possible. And sometimes a, a president's got to say, you know what? I don't believe it. I'm not listening to it. Right. He does the same thing with, in a lot of ways. I mean, right. he, do, he did that just recently with his, um, with his intelligence, the intelligence sure, sure. briefing right, right. Um, in, 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 uh, in the Senate. So the, it's, and the other thing is Trump is a different guy. You know, sure. Trump is a different guy than any other kind of president. He's very much more of a marketing-oriented president. He's very much more of a salesman than we've ever had as a president. And he really is very hyper-focused on what the messages are that he's sending, again, not only to his, his base, but to the other base, too. So he's really conscious of that kind of stuff. And I, it's hard to say. I mean, it, it certainly looks like some of the policies, in terms of regulation, for instance, run counter to what some of the evidence says in terms right. of, of what the benefits versus the costs are of regulation or, or immigration. Sure. Some of these policies would, in a sense, it seems like to me, run counter to what the logic is from what the data is saying that we know of in terms of, of climate change, again, and regulations, in terms of, 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 of immigration reform, even tax policy. I mean, I think a lot of those things, the data to me seems to say that the policies that are being formulated now aren't helpful. But I'm one voter. I mean, right. you know, other people say it's great. You know. Well, let, let's change gears a little bit then. So, <clears throat> I, I kind of been discussing or, or bringing up here what I think government isn't. I, in my opinion, mm -hmm. it's kind of like there's all this data, and I don't know if people are, you know, maybe it's being used behind the scenes, and maybe, you know, the lawmakers just <clears throat> say what they think their constituents want to hear, but they're really looking at the data and working with it when it actually comes to the lawmaking. Like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that I don't believe this, but right. when it, I really do, and I'm gonna try to make some laws based on it. But, so you're, you're working with, uh, or, or, or at least talk to, yeah. a lot of local politicians, mm -hmm. and I know that you're, you're actually working with uh, uh, an unnamed person who is going to be running for a California mm -hmm. uh, congressional, congressional seat, seat. At, some, at some point. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking to them, just, person to person, do you get the sense that they want to actually problem solve, mm -hmm. as opposed to just, I'm going, my constituent said they want this, so I'm just going to give them that, even though that may not really solve a problem? Yeah, yeah. That's a really good question, and it's one that I've, I've asked of many, many people, not only people that I'm working with, but people that I've interviewed uh, who are politicians running for office. And the way I catch it generally is, you know, do you consider yourself a conciliator or a fighter? And, and from my perspective, what that means is everybody got elected from a base, generally speaking. There's a base that you have that you make promises to, and there's certain issues that you align with them on, and then hopefully you build beyond that base. But you make promises to those people based on what you say and what you're going to do when you get into office. Um, but the work of government is to, is to really conciliate, is to really make deals. I mean, that's the way it works. I mean, government wasn't really initially set up this way in our, our right, country right. 250 years ago, but it's the way it's evolved. We have a very, very strong uh, bipartisan, uh, bipolar system. So you need to make deals. So if you go in as a, as a strongly progressive Democrat, and let's, let's, use, let's use a real world example. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez comes into Congress as a 29-year-old, uh, took yep. down, young, 29 yep. years old, took down one of, one of the Democrats' leaders in the House uh, in her district in the primary and then won the general because it's a very, very blue-leaning district. Um, so she comes in and, and, again, her district is very blue. She comes in with a lot of progressive policy that she says, you know, she wants a gr Green New Deal. She wants, you know, Medicare for all. She wants, you know, college for all. You know, there's a lot of things she wants that are fairly left-leaning on the spectrum. She's probably not going to be able to get much of any of that done. <laughs> right, right. So she has to decide, and she will decide as time goes along. She probably will be in Congress for a while. She has to decide as time goes along, and she wants to get some committee seats, and she wants to begin to do things and get things done. How she can do that? Can you horse train on things? Can you say, well, listen, I can't get all this Green New Deal I want. i got to give up some of the restrictions on, you know, on oil and gas industry. Okay, maybe you have to do that. Maybe you have to give up on some of your regulation reform that you want. Okay, but because of that, you can get something else done. 
or maybe you can get uh, Medicare for all. I mean, you have to horse trade. Now, will her constituents hit her over the head for that? Some probably will. She has right. to make a decision, again, when she goes back to the polls in two years, will she be able to make that work? Will she be able to get reelected, continue to do the work she wants to do and explain it to her constituency? Congress people all over the country are going through this very issue. Right. Um, that's why you see people vote, <laughs> People vote for things really not on their conscience. They vote for things based on what their uh, what their electoral um, realities are. You look at Joe Manchin, who is a, a, a senator in West Virginia. He's a Democrat, right? Um, very conservative Democrat, very centrist Democrat. He's voted for Trump a lot more than a person like Kamala Harris here in California, who's a, who's also a senator sure. and much more progressive senator. Um, because Manchin knows, and he just did, he, he was reelected in 20, 2018. He knows that he can't go out to his constituency being very anti-Trump, regardless of what his beliefs really are. I don't know what his beliefs really are. I know what right. his voting record is. He's voted with Trump a lot more than the average Democrat. So the realities of your district kind of have to force your hand in terms of what you believe. And whether you're a conciliator or a fighter depends on the reality of, of, of the, the voting of the election that you have to run. Okay. Does so, that make sense? I don't think yeah, that's no, a question. It, it, but. it makes sense, but let, let's, let's, let's kind of, let's kind of uh, uh, wrap this up. And, and if you could, if you could tell a politician, mm -hmm. Or, 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 you know, politicians, lawmakers, uh, if you could tell them, look, here is a way that I think you can solve problems, fact-based, and meet your, uh, uh, the desires of your constituents, because after all, that's why they put you in office, yeah. to meet mm -hmm. their desires. Yeah. Do, do you have an opinion on how that should be done that's maybe different than what you see currently being done? Do, do, do you think there's a better way to do this or is, hey, the system's basically just churning it out the way it should? I'm a centrist, so I'm a centrist. So I like people that are gonna go in there and make deals. I, okay. I think that, uh, to me, what I would like, and again, I'm an uncommon voter, I'm just one voter, but I'm uncommon. I like to hear uh, my, um, uh, my representatives say, Listen, I don't have all the answers. I'm going to work across the aisle with people that are, are maybe don't have the same belief system as me and try to find common ground. I would like that. But again, I'm not a common voter. Today, the system is becoming much more pulled to the, to the edges of the center. So most, and I'm, I'm a de registered Democrat in the interest of disclosure. So most Democrats can't say that and get elected in a blue district. Say, well, I'm gonna really aggressively go to try to work across well, the aisle. Do, do you think do you think voters care about data? In in, in other and I, and I, you voters, know what I'm saying. Vo voters, <laughs> remember, voters are emotional creatures. Yeah. Voters care about the data that aligns with their with beliefs. their beliefs, right? And right. I mean, people don't like data that doesn't al agree with what they say. I mean, we've seen it in the pages of, of Quality Digest on the comment boards where sure. you know you talk about climate change and there'll be a, a huge debate about climate change or Six Sigma. I mean, yeah. some of these these topics that uh, that have passionate disagreement uh, about them and to transform or not to transform data. I right. mean, things like that, where you have these really passionate arguments and you know, people don't want to hear data that, that contradicts what they believe in. I mean, most don't. Most want to feel like, I'm smart, I know what I'm talking about, see, that proves my point. Now, right. with climate change, for instance, extreme weather, whatever the, the phrase that you want to use is, there's a lot of data and there's been a lot of data for a long period of time that shows that yes, man is contributing to climate change. I mean, it's 10, 15 years ago, we yeah. really kind of considered an open and shut case. Even Republicans were saying that that right, this right. was the case. Um, but there is emotionally a portion of the American populace who doesn't believe that. Um, and no data is gonna move them. So if you want their vote, if you're in a, uh, in a deep red district and you want their vote, you're probably not going to not going to say you believe or are going to support policy that uh, that is is climate change policy, even though you may maybe you're a college professor and, and you, you ran for senate, you may believe it personally, but you're not going to vote that way and you're not going to promote it that way on the on the stump. So the upshot is, as people have said for a long long time, is you can't run government like you run a business. Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, that's basically what we've come down to. I mean, because remember, th this argument has come up. Well, we know we need a businessman in in you know well, an office because they understand business and how it works. But when you come, business de depends on data. And if what we're saying is we're we're not going to use data. Business somewhat depends on data. <laughs> business also depends on marketing and sales and PR. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and from that perspective, this is what we're talking about. It's 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 marketing. Yeah. It really is marketing. I mean, I've I've come down to this, and in my business, I've looked at it and I said, listen, somebody running for office, somebody coming out with a new product or service, it's a very similar process. You you know, you look at the the good points of that person or that product, and you and you focus on that. You say, hey, here here's who this person or thing is. And you try to convince users, customers, voters, this is a good thing, you need this, you should support this. Right. And you're putting the best face on it, it's marketing. Yeah. But it's also data, because you can't just ignore it. I mean, again, I, <clears throat> I think even this administration, this federal administration, which is notoriously, in terms of its priorities, <clears throat> is not a data-based administration. It, right. it, it will tend to want to ignore that data you know, in, in terms of actually the media and in terms right, right, of right, promoting, right. Uh, saying what they're, they're doing, they're going to ignore that data and they're going to have policy that's going to not conform with that for a lot of reasons. Who knows what all the reasons are? Some of it right. probably has to do with who their donor base is. Right. And they're, they're supporting those, those protocols. And that, that makes sense. I understand that. But to say it's totally unlike business, I don't think is true. There's differences, there's a lot of similarities too, in terms of how you bring, again, a, 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 a candidate or a product to market. I think it's very similar in a lot of ways. Okay, well, Mike Richmond, solving the world's problems, one person at a one, time. One, one interview at a time. <laughs> one interview that's right. at a time. Yeah, that's right. All right, <laughs> thanks for joining us. I uh, pr appreciate your insights, and uh, um, I, I, it sounds like you're having a good time. I'm having a good time. I'm learning a lot. You know, I mean, I, uh, I, I always say to people, you know, keep your eye on, on, the, uh, on politics because it, it, it really is. We didn't really talk a lot about uh, the shutdown stuff, or right, right. which is probably going to come back now in, in about 10 days. Um, <laughs> right. uh, That's why know, you can't get any interviews with anybody at NIST. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, we're just nobody I here. I mean, because that, that's a big part of this, too. I mean, yeah. how it affects research and trade policy. Yep. We didn't really get to that, that stuff, but there's some data-based, uh, data-driven approach that affect that as well in terms of that, that kind of policy. So yep. maybe we'll talk about that in the coming <laughs> show. All right, so uh, that is it for today's Quality Digest Live. I'm Mike, thanks for joining us. Uh, as usual, if you have some ideas of topics that you would like us to uh, explore on the show, send those ideas to us at qdl at qualitydigest.com and uh, we'll try to bring those people or those things onto the show. Thanks for joining us and we will see you again next week. So long. How long was that? It was probably 25 minutes or so. <laughs>